her story. Well, in 1974, Clarice Stass wrote, history as a discipline can be characterized as having a collective forgetfulness about women. And frankly, looking back at history, that's true. It is history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. Her story is our effort in Maryland to complete the history by putting her story with his story. And we have our story of the men and women who've made significant contributions to our state's social, political, and economic order here in Maryland. Her story is co-produced by the Maryland Women's Heritage Center and McDonough Davis Associates. The show focuses on contributions that women have made throughout our state and from throughout the state's history to our social, political, and economic order. For each episode, we will have a special guest with our contributions, or perhaps the contributions and achievements that other women have made to our social, political, and economic order. Our guests will include women from a variety of fields, medicine, education, politics, law, the arts, and so many more. We'll also highlight very special events throughout the state that have meaning for women. The Maryland Women's Heritage Center sponsors a number of throughout the state. Fortunately, there are a lot of other organizations who do as well, and so we partner with them. Today's show focuses on the induction of many women into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. Six to be exact. This event on March 29th in Annapolis. It's an annual event, and we, it's very inspiring and motivating to see the many women. Now we'll be right back, so don't go away. To guide and advise. That is a beautiful capsule. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you, Gail. Next, I will welcome acknowledging a few people I have with me today. My classmates from Leadership Greater Washington. So thank you all for being here. early. <laughs> uh, members of the Maryland State Board of Education and the State Superintendent, Dr. Lillian Lowry. My sisters, and what I believe is the greatest sorority in the world, Delta. Leads to the one that you're most proud of. I've mm. always found it to be true that God closes a door and opens a window, and you just have to be ready when that window opens to Lord. see the... Sure feel the breeze and, and see the, the path to yeah. whatever. Well, that's wonderful to have that vision. Thank you again, and we so much appreciate your thoughts. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, to young women, act like a lady and work like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll keep that message. I support whatever it is I've, I've tried to do. Thank you very much. You know, as I thought about this, you realize that you never know where your life is going to take you. And I think back and I, I've often said to others, I think I led three lives. I started out as a science teacher in Baltimore County, and then a politician, and finally a diplomat. But I can tell you that there is nothing that prepares you for any history. And one of the greatest singers in American history, Eleanor Fagan, known to us as Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, born in Baltimore City, Maryland on April 7, 1915, lived in poverty with her mother during her early years. In the fifth grade, she traded in her formal education for child labor in order to have food and shelter. Bernice, can you tell us how is this award, um, what does it mean to the estate of Billie Holiday? It means a lot to us because uh, She's been honored. I also went to accept the stamp. We made the stamp for Billy Holiday. I also went, well, I've been to several, a lot of things that they did inducting Billy Holiday into different things. And it means a lot to the whole estate because there's some more on the estate beside me, his sons and all. And this honor tonight was really very nice. You know? Hi, this interview is a little bit different because this is honoring Jean Cryer who is deceased, but what a legacy she has left. And we're getting to interview today one of her daughters, uh, Allison Cryer DiNardo, and she's kept her mother's name for her middle name, as I have with mine. So, 
feel about it very much. So I'll be asking you about your mom, okay. and which is wonderful to have a daughter talk about her. Drive away from trees and stream. Not toward the stream, I said to them. Drive away from the stream. Jennifer is really weeding really her garden, her flower garden. I can love her weeding her. That's a nice quote. Grandma is a warrior, Emma said, mocking me. Anna, with her Tarbar accent, said, you a warrior. Grandma's a warrior? And Jennifer said, did you say warrior? Did you say warrior? Grandma is a warrior. That she is. She said, yes, I'm a warrior, and I'm a warrior. Welcome. And thank you so much for yeah. having me. Yeah, and congratulations on your induction oh. into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. It's quite an honor. It really is, and well deserved. I, well, there are a lot of people who could walk in these shoes, so yeah. I thank you, though. Well, would you talk a little bit about what you think in your work might have brought you to this day? Well, you know, I started. I had planned to say tonight when your last name begins with T. To <laughs> <laughs> stand in between. The people in this audience and the reception. <laughs> <laughs> so I will take that into consideration. <laughs> Good evening and thanks to each of you for taking the time to tell attend this. It, it is, isn't it? It's very <laughs> exciting. So um Tell us a little about your mom, and we're sorry that she can't be here with us today. Yes, yeah, so am I. Yes. <laughs> um, very much so. Um, well, there's so much to say about my mom. There, um, in terms of just qualities, her warmth, her ability to connect with other people, her intelligence, her strength. She was a fighter, uh, but she was kind and was no pushover. <laughs> You know, um, I could talk a lot about her accomplishments, but I can also sort of give you a sense of who she was. She had such a profound effect on a number of people. Um, her friendships, I think, really speak a lot to who she was. Her not only her professional life, but who she was in her private life and with her family. She was also very involved with the Women's Heritage Center, so we were thrilled to have her working with us. But she also had a whole life outside, I'm sure, of your family and a life outside the Heritage Center. Yes. So tell us a little bit about her professional upbringing. Throughout the state of Maryland and even internationally, Delegate Adrian Mandel was a good friend and colleague of Miss Ward. <coughs> and she's going to tell us a little bit more about her work. Delegate Mandel. Thank you very much, Judy. It's my honor to be here with these magnificent women, all the honorees tonight. I am a former delegate, not a sitting current delegate. And fortunately, I'm able to continue my public service because all of us here this evening are public servants. I'm now immersed and you'll excuse the pun, in uh, serving as one of six commissioners for a body to preserve social security, Medicare, and thank you, Congresswoman Barbara Keneally, who is chair of that very important committee, for being with us tonight to honor Sue Ward's induction. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And please be assured we have many more in store for you they will be fun and exciting. I'm Francie Glendenning, president of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center, the co-producer of this show. We look forward, as I said, to having you with us again. And we encourage you to participate in our events. Thank you all for being here today. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, Mother Nature, another woman, of course, a small on us. Um, naturally today, because we're doing the right thing. I've been asked to talk about women in Maryland history. Uh, women of Achievement, the women in this book. Now, if I tried to talk about all the women in this book, we would be here to the sign next year when we have this again. And so I'm going to just give you a little, a little bit different perspective. This is Women of Achievement in Maryland History. But I'd like, to, I'd like to have you just change the lens a little bit and think of them also as women leaders as leaders in so many ways. Now, leadership, and this is something I teach, so I'm, I'm, I've thought about it a great deal. Leadership is really an elusive kind of thing. People really aren't sure 
how they define it. It's, it's sort of one of those things you know when you see it. And there's no specific formula for leadership. There's no particular type of person. Leaders come in all shapes and sizes and backgrounds, etc. Um, and you can be a leader in your family, you can be a leader on the sports team, you can be a leader, you can be an elected official, you can be head of a non-profit organization, you can be any of the three women who have just preceded me on the podium, and so many of you here today have been leaders and you know, in just innumerable ways. And that's something I'd like you to think about, not only the ways that you've been a leader in the past, perhaps, but how you might continue. Just look at your eligibility and your potential for leadership in the community in the future. Because we need every person's talent and every person's gift. And I frequently commit myself, until I take my last gasp, which will be many years from now, you all will have to be putting up with me on this. Um, and I tell my son the reason that I try to exercise and eat healthily is because I plan to be around even guidance and instruction for many, many years to come. Which of course he has kind of, he has he's pulled two ways about that, as you might imagine. Now, I'm going to share with you some information about five Maryland women. Very different types of leaders, but leaders nonetheless. And I want to talk to you about how they came to be leaders and the very different kinds of situations. Perhaps the first is the easiest role we envision when someone is really explicitly asked to assume the leadership role. And here I actually call, as you might think, upon former Maryland First Lady Mary Diggs Lee from Anne Arundel County. She served uh, as First Lady from 1779 to 1783, which was during the Revolutionary War. And during that time, Governor Lee um, received, well, he'd only been in office for a short time, but he received an impassioned letter from General George Washington. And if you think back at the time, this is a very difficult time. The, the troops were demoralized, they, they had no food, they had no clothing, uh, they literally were just, their clothing was hanging on them. So he sent this letter to, to the governor, uh, the general did, and said, we need your help. Can you ask your wife if she would be willing to go and get money and supplies and materials and so forth? Well, now you can imagine this kind of a letter would place a great deal of pressure on the governor. And so, in an unprecedented move, he turned to his wife for support. And I say unprecedented because in the 18th century, remember, women were involved like we are today. <coughs> Women were not involved in politics. And they certainly weren't involved in public. You didn't ask for money. You didn't ask for support. You did not do those kinds of things. And so you were barred from the public arena, with very few exceptions. And although she knew she could be subjected to intense scrutiny and ridicule, the First Lady consented eagerly to her husband's request. Now her efforts produced significant results for the troops, which also, you know, which really ultimately enhanced morale, enabling the Continental troops to continue fighting. And so, of course, she assumed a very vital leadership role during her times. And in doing so, she advanced the status of women in addition to serving her country and her state. Now, sometimes a personal tragedy presents the potential for leadership. And here I think of my, my longtime friend, Roberta Roper, who Many, many years ago, I believe it was 1982, unfortunately, one late night, her daughter Stephanie was brutally murdered. And I say brutally, and I won't go into the details. Roberta was an art teacher at the time. But not only the brutal murder, but the way she was treated, with the, she and her family were treated in the criminal justice system, really just took every, everything from her. Until one day she read in her daughter's journal, I believe one person can make a difference, and every person should try. And with those words that she read from her, her slain daughter, she, this catapulted her, really galvanized her into action. And now Maryland has the motto, Victims Assistance or Victims Rights Program in the country because of her 23-year journey 
We are the first state to have a victim's rights amendment to our state constitution, and she still, many years later, fights for a victim's rights amendment to, to our national constitution. Now, in other circumstances, I would be able to recognize a need to do what's necessary. And I love to think of um, some another person that I met, native Prince George and Maud Savoy Brown. She was born in 1894, and she married in her early 20s. A man with whom she had 15 children. Now I say you're a leader there. If you do nothing more, I'm telling you. And to say that she and her 15 children lived modestly is an understatement. From early in her life, she was an active member of the Mount Lebo African Methodist Episcopal Church, which comforted her a great deal when her husband, the father of her 15 children, passed away. Well, she then made her marry a man named Harry Brown, who had eight children. So, you know, I, I'm worried, but I can't do math. When you had, that, there's a, that's a lot, that's eight, that's 23 kids. Well, for many years they barely survived, and it wasn't till, frankly, she didn't have electricity or plumbing or refrigerator until 1955. Because she was concerned about her many children and those in the community, Maud founded the Mount Nebo Gospel Singers in 1949. And as you can imagine, initially this was composed largely of her own children. <laughs> to this day, the choir has grown and performed in a number of states on the East Coast, and the highlight for her was when they performed in the, at the White House during the Christmas holidays in 1997. She also initially established both the sports activities and the choir to provide an outlet for her children and others to teach them responsibility, discipline, and to keep them occupied. Again, another leader, very different kind. But everybody has their role to play. And indeed, one of my favorites, I love this, Rachel Carson. She was an environmentalist. And incidentally, when I asked my students, do you know who Rachel Carson was? And they'll say, well, wasn't she some kind of environmentalist or something? And I'll say, guess what? We didn't even think of people as being environmentalists until Rachel Carson wrote her book, Silent Spring. Although she did, she started in Pennsylvania, as most good people do. If you're not born in Maryland, you get here as soon as you can. <laughs> so when she came to the great state of Maryland to get her um, master's degree from Johns Hopkins University, she combined her talents of writing and, and biology and wrote, actually started writing articles for the Baltimore Sun. She began working for the Bureau of Fisheries in 1935 and wrote a couple books, but it was her third book, Silent Spring, which really was something that forever changed the way we think about the environment. It was published in 1962 and believe me, it unleashed a firestorm of controversy about the deadly effects of poisonous pesticides on the environment. In fact, I, I have read accounts of how she was referred to, and at one point she was referred to as an overly sympathetic, low-level, bureaucrat, female scientist. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But that's how she was viewed because she stepped forward. And she was definitely heard. I'm happy to report that President Kennedy's science, that then President Kennedy's science advisor, Dr. Jerome Weissler, found himself that the dangers resulting from DDT and related compounds were potentially more serious than nuclear fallout. And all these findings, the firestorm, were brought on by this low-level bureaucrat female scientist from the Bureau of Fisheries, who was overly sympathetic, I might add. Her voice was indeed heard. The last example from our own history that I'm going to give you today is, a, is really someone who came to leadership. She evolved through her life's work. Another wonderful woman whom I greatly admire and was fortunate enough to meet before her past. Margaret Rawson's lifespan was from 1899 to 2001. And she produced an extraordinary body of work just devoted exclusively to understanding 
dyslexia. Again, she started in Pennsylvania, but she got to Maryland, like all smart people do, as you might imagine. And we were fortunate enough that the work she did, she realized that some of the young men that she worked with in her classroom had special problems. And so she set out and spent the rest of her life, literally, writing about and researching about these young men. And in fact, she produced several longitudinal studies that now provide the great body of work that we have about dyslexia. The whole point of all these, of telling you about all these women, is not to bore you to death. But I want you all again, I go back to my original point, which is to consider your own eligibility and potential for leadership. And I know that you all are and have been in many ways. But as I am always telling my good friend Kendall and Maria and also Dr. Grasnick, our work is never finished. And as Margaret Mead once said, we need every human gift and cannot afford to neglect any gift because of artificial barriers of sex or race or class or natural origin. And we have to remind ourselves that we all have a role to play. And there are also many roles. And I love this. This is my favorite, and I need no disrespect to any elected officials you can imagine. But if Rosa Parks, as Mary Frances Berry once said, if Rosa Parks had taken a poll before she decided to sit down in the bus in Montgomery, she'd still be standing. So I urge you to look around, to share your gifts, to assume, to assume leadership wherever it might be needed in very unique ways. I thank you and I look forward to the many decades that we have ahead of us where I'll be working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Now, um, what extraordinary group of uh, women we have inducted to our women's, uh, Maryland Women's Hall of Fame this evening. Uh, don't you agree? Aren't they all great? The names, photos, and biographies of all our five honorees will be posted uh, permanently on the website of the Maryland State Archives and will be uh, recorded permanently on a plaque at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center as well. And I'd like to invite my good friend, um, is uh, Delhi here? Is Delhi Kelly here yet? Okay, Catherine Hill, uh, behalf of the Women's uh, Caucus, can you come up here to present the plaque to the Women's uh, Heritage Center? We uh, here to accept the plaque are um, our, uh, Frances Ann Blundetti, Chair of the Board, and uh, Diana Bailey, Managing Director of the Women's Heritage Center. Please, please come up. Good evening. Talk long, and some of you are, have been who are here this evening know just how long and how for how many years it has been my pleasure and privilege to celebrate the accomplishments of our wonderful Maryland women, past, present, and next future. I also want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge my good friend and colleague, First Lady of Maryland, who is a very accomplished, passionate, and caring woman. Thank you for your friendship. You know, it seems to me that the two words, I always try to think of a word that characterizes the evening. And tonight the two words for me are leadership and courage. Now we know leadership when we see it. And we also know leadership when we don't. It's the lack of leadership. A number of years ago, some of you are probably too young to know what this was, during um, the, the hearings um, where Dr. Anita Hill spoke, um, and was very courageous, but some other people weren't too courageous. Some other of our leaders were not too courageous. That was a lack of leadership. You know I like women's quotes, and I think the quote that I will remember about that time was from former Congresswoman Patricia Sch Schroeder, who said, in characterizing those people who did not come forward, so much power, so little leadership. Excuse me, my losing my voice, which I think is a tragedy, but I'm not sure anybody else. <laughs> we know in Maryland that doesn't happen. We don't have a lack of leadership in Maryland 
from our past, women in the past, women in the present, women who are moving in the future, who make such contributions to our social, political, economic order. So what happens? What's the difference between those who show leadership and who don't? What's courage? The late uh, Anais Nin once wrote, Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. For those who have been honored tonight, your courage, you must have an extraordinarily full life, and not only have your lives been full, but you've enriched in the, large, the lives of all of us in the state of Maryland. And I thank you for that, as do we all. And now I'm going to ask my colleague, um, oh, sorry, I thought I'm passing this along. Oh, I'm passing, passing the torch. torch. Passing the torch. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask uh, Diana to come up just from, just, just to say, have a picture. All right. <laughs> Diana is the managing director of the Maryland Security Center. Just Dr. Washington, she'd be happy, we'd be happy with a $5,000 check. We're not greedy, $100,000. <laughs> Thank you. All right.